Trading card games have always been one of those constants of nerd culture for the past few decades. Since the release and almost immediate popularity of Magic the Gathering in 1993, new and inventive card games have popped up and faded away almost just as fast, with a select few able to weather the storm of the initial years to come out as mainstays of the medium, such as Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, both of which released in Japan in 96. For the most part, though, all of these games had one major point in common. They were physical card games. While the occasional online card game simulator would pop up for the big three, such as MTG Online in 2002, Dueling Network for Yu-Gi-Oh!, and Pokemon TCG Online, both released in 2011, all of these operated simply as a way to play those physical games in an online setting rather than being built from the ground up as their own unique game. This was about to change, as in early 2014, a new player in the card game space would make itself known and fast changing the industry entirely as the online card game space would be revolutionized forever by its release. This is the story of the rise, and subsequent stumbling, of the first true titan in online card games, how they changed the industry, and how they brought us to where we are today. This is the history of Hearthstone. The year is 2008. Blizzard as a company had made a significant name for itself, especially over the course of the last few years. Game franchises like Diablo, StarCraft, and their personal baby, Warcraft, had all become massive names in the video game industry, with their latest success story being World of Warcraft, an MMORPG that completely revolutionized the genre and the industry as a whole in 2004, with its first expansion, The Burning Crusade, released the previous year, receiving nearly universal acclaim, and its second expansion, Wrath of the Lich King, due out at the end of the year. At this stage, almost all of their games had their own private development groups, being creatively named Teams 1 through 4, consisting of roughly 50 plus people each and working on games over multi-year development cycles. In 2008, Blizzard authorized the creation of a new, far smaller team of developers, known as Team 5, with the goal of revolutionizing how Blizzard themselves developed games, aiming for smaller scale projects using a much faster and adaptable group, consisting of only 15 members in its early stages. This was primarily done because of how smaller development teams in the industry had revolutionized aspects of gaming that weren't conceived of before then, such as the independent team that created a mod for Blizzard's own Warcraft 3 called Defense of the Ancients, whose mod was so groundbreaking that it spawned an entire new genre of games known as MOBAs, with Valve buying the rights to Dota in 2009 to create a sequel in 2013, and one of the lead developers in Dota's later years, Steve Gwinsofeek, would move on to his next company, Riot Games where he would help the development of League of Legends, which similarly revolutionized the genre of MOBAs again. Blizzard, recognizing how they could have developed something similar, tasked the new Team 5 with experimenting with game concepts to find the next big directional pivot in the games industry, with the team seemingly deciding on the direction of an online card game before 2012 due to their collective love of games like Magic the Gathering across the company as a whole. It was decided early on that characters and concepts for the game would come from World of Warcraft, as many members of Team 5 had previously worked on WoW and aimed to give the new game its own identity by employing a mixture of what lead designer Eric Dodds called two parts epic and maybe one part whimsical fun, and adding to it a few more dashes of charm and whimsy, and maybe even a dash of irreverence. Greenlit with the name Warcraft Legends, the team would immediately begin development only for a majority of the team to be pulled off for ensuring the launch date deadline of StarCraft II was met leaving only Eric Dodds and Ben Brode to prototype the game. This allowed the two to rapidly iterate on what they had already set a baseline for, seeing a Flash concept that was effectively the final game's design, just much cruder, being used as a template to translate the game into its final form with all the polish and refining needed once the team returned from their stint on StarCraft II. The game was officially announced to the world at PAX East on March 24, 2013, with Rob Pardo, the chief creative officer at Blizzard at the time, going into detail on the game's structure and how he hoped it would be a stepping stone of innovation for the company as a whole. The closed alpha stages would begin somewhere in April, with closed beta beginning in August and the eventual open beta in January of 2014, seeing various changes to card balance and system tweaks during that time. Finally, on March 13, 2014, the official launch of Hearthstone to the world would take place and would begin the online collectible card game revolution. It is said 
that wars are only won upon the anvil of honor. Others believe victory requires strategy and a mastery of power. But of course, you could forget all that and just have fun! Hearthstone! Heroes of Warcraft! Hearthstone was launched with 9 classes, a core set of free cards, and a base set of unlockable cards all for experimentation out the gate. In a game of Hearthstone, each player will have a turn to play their cards and make attacks to the opponent before passing the turn back to them, with each turn having a maximum amount of mana that can be spent on cards, starting at 1 and increasing by 1 each turn. Because of this, most decks were built around what's known as a curve, which is to say that the level of mana the deck wished to operate at most effectively was generally centralized to a point, with a ratio of costs decreasing as you went above and below that point, with aggro decks centralized around a lower mana count, mid-range decks somewhere in the middle, and control decks favoring the more expensive side of the spectrum. While there are effects on most Hearthstone cards, a number of effects that were common between multiple cards would be centralized down into a keyword, such as the initial keywords of Battlecry, an effect that happens when the card is played, Death Rattle, an effect that happens when the card is destroyed, Taunt, preventing attacking anything without Taunt on the board, Charge, where the minion could attack the turn it's played, even into the opponent's life total, Divine Shield, blocking the first instance of damage to that minion, Stealth, making the minion untargetable until it attacked, cancelling out Taunt when both are active, Wind Fury, letting a card attack twice in a turn, Poisonous, which destroys anything it damages, Freeze, which stunned any affected character from attacking for one turn, Choose One, which gave you the option of two effects and let you pick which one you wanted to apply, Overload, which locked that many mana crystals from use the following turn, Secret, an effect that would be on your board going into the opponent's turn, triggerable by a specific action taken by the opponent, combo, similar to Battlecry but only triggering if you've played a card before it, and what would eventually be condensed down into the Enrage keyword, where an effect is only active while the minion is damaged. Each of the nine classes was built out with their own unique identity and playstyle, with Druid being nature-focused with mana ramping and multi-choice cards, Hunter being beast-focused with heavy aggro and mid-range tools, especially when combined with its hero power, Mage being spell-focused with lots of damaging effects as well as a secondary focus on the freeze effect, which had been toned down from the initial beta where it was extremely powerful, Paladin being focused on smaller human minions with stat manipulation and Divine Shield being a focal point, Priest being a dual nature deal with its holy cards healing and its shadow cards dealing damage, Rogue being focused around cost reductions and comboing cards with one another, Shaman with a focus on totems and the overload mechanic, allowing you to effectively front-load your mana costs, Warlock being all about demons and self-damaging effects, whether it be health or discards, and Warrior being all about armor gain and raw board control into heavy amounts of raw damage with the Enrage mechanic. In addition to these class identities, there was also a neutral card pool that provided a variety of tools that can fit into any of the nine classes, fueling various strategies, with the entire card pool being chock full of references to World of Warcraft and its universe, with even some more internet culture memes to boot. At launch, the game had already been heavily balanced and playtested out through the beta stage, meaning that most classes in some regard had a deck or playstyle that could operate in this launch meta. That said, as in all card games, some decks and archetypes are going to be more powerful than others purely from how balance plays out, and in this initial period, the deck that was seemingly the go-to strategy was undoubtedly Miracle Rogue. The neutral minion of Gadget Sand Auctioneer was a powerful resource for Rogue specifically, being a 5-mana minion that let the controller draw a card any time they played a spell. Because of Rogue's ability to mana cheat, you could easily chain spell after spell with Auctioneer active to draw more and more cards, which fueled in turn more spells. Combining this with a minion like Questing Adventurer could usually spell the end of the game relatively quickly, especially with tools to help the adventurer survive its one turn waiting period, like Conceal to make it stealthed for a turn. While this combo deck was powerful, combo had a tendency to lose hard to aggro strategies, like the popular Face Hunter, which aimed to use a combination of various charge minions, knife juggler, and the hunter hero power to output rapid amounts of damage. This was boosted further by a 4-mana combination of Starving Buzzard and Unleash the Hounds, which got you anywhere from 1-6 to six draws from Buzzard to refuel in addition to the charge damage of the Hound Summons. 
making the aggro deck never truly run out of gas. However, aggro decks can only do what they need to if they can push a lethal line before the opponent can stabilize effectively, which is where control decks thrive, and Control Warrior owned that space at launch. Control Warrior took heavy advantage of the various mass damage tools in the format at the time, like Whirlwind and Baron Geddon, to clear boards while also triggering their own damage effects, like Acolyte of Pain, Armorsmith, and the big one being Gromish Hellscreen. Standardly, the game would be ended by Alexstrasza evening the life count out for a Ragnaros or Gromish, with Faceless Manipulator always able to duplicate what stuck. The only issue with Control Warrior at this time was the cost. Commonly, the deck played between 3 and 5 legendary minions, which was a large cost at about 8,000 dust to craft those alone, marking the deck as probably the most pay-to-win deck of the era, which luckily it wasn't the only option. Other strategies of this initial period included Ramp Druid, using Wild Growth and Nourish to gain mana crystals to use late game minions quickly, Handlock, which aimed to use the Warlock hero power to draw quickly and early to play full value Twilight Drakes and Mountain Giants, then back them up with Defender of Argus or Sun Fury Protector to make them hard to maneuver around, and Zulok, the exact opposite of Handlock, aimed at flooding the board with cheap minions to push early damage with cards like Knife Juggler, Direwolf Alpha, Soulfire, and Doomguard. If the game is sounding like it's a little on the overwhelming side, not to worry. Golden packs were always easy to grind thanks to Arena, where for 150 gold you could draft a deck using the standard cards to play against others who did the same with similar records until you won 12 or lost 3, earning gold, dust, and packs for performing well, with 3 wins getting you the value of your entry back and 7 giving you enough gold to cover your next entry. Players use the Arena now and for a long time after as a way to grind gold for packs outside of the daily mission grind, which would only give you a little gold per day. Of course, you could always offset that by buying packs, which was the game's primary income stream, but for obvious reasons many players desired to play the game as free to play as possible at this initial launch period. As for balancing, for the most part the game had no balance patches or ban lists, as a way to keep the game as familiar as possible to new and returning players as you didn't want people who've never played a card game before to suddenly realize mid-match that the card you were playing didn't do what you remembered it doing, as most of the balance changes were made during the alpha and beta testing phases of the game. There was only one balance change during this initial launch period, occurring on May 8th. Unleash the Hounds was nerfed from 2 to 3 mana, making the Unleash and Buzzard combo cost 5 total mana now, up from 4. This was a relatively minor change, as all it did was delay the aggro draw tool by one turn, but it was a drop in the bucket compared to changes made in later eras. However, the basic and classic sets were never really the end-all plan for Hearthstone, as expansions were planned to be a part of it too adding new cards to the pool, and changing how certain decks were positioned in the metagame, starting in July with... Whispers of an ancient tomb. Holding horrors in every room. And if by chance you should survive... There's plenty of sweet loot inside now. Curse of Noxramas, a Hearthstone adventure. Curse of Noxramas was the first ever content edition brought to Hearthstone, released on July 22nd, and it was an interesting direction to take for new cards. Rather than purchasing packs, Noxramas' cards were included in a single player campaign, where you'd unlock various new cards by completing boss challenges, some of which were extremely difficult for the time. For 700 gold per wing, or $25 in total, you could play through 5 wings of new single player content, one coming out each week, and unlock new powerful cards for the meta. Many of these cards would immediately become staples of the meta on release, like Zombie Chow, an early drop for control decks that allowed them to contest aggro minions and regain their health, Sludge Belcher, a 3-5 taunt that summoned another 1-2 taunt when destroyed, providing multiple walls for you to play with, or easily the most popular legendary from the set, Loatheb, who made the opponent's spells for the next turn cost 5 more, a perfect counter for the popular Miracle Rogue. As for how the meta shook out from this expansion, while most of the faces from the launch meta were still present, each of them were sporting new tools. Zulok would see a significant upgrade here in the form of Voidcaller, which allowed the deck to cheat out more and more powerful demons, like Doomguard, who could dodge the discard cost if summoned this way. 
Miracle Rogue was still one of the best decks of the format, as while Loatheb was an excellent counter to the strategy, they themselves could play Loatheb too, so it made countering out the combo that much more difficult. Control Priest and Warrior both saw significant upticks in play here thanks to the new control tools from the expansion, like Deathlord, which was a counter to combo decks as you could simply rip the combo piece out of the deck directly, Unstable Ghoul, which cleared early aggro minions and triggered warriors and rage effects, and Spectral Knight, who was difficult to remove with its targeting protection, in addition to the previously mentioned Zombie Chow, Sludge Belcher, and Loatheb. However, the big deck of the expansion that was undeniably the most powerful was the new deck in the meta named Death Rattle Hunter, which played a significant number of the new Death Rattle minions like Web Spinner, Haunted Creeper, and Arubian Egg, and older Death Rattles like Leper Gnome, Loot Hoarder, and Blood Mage Thalnos, in combination with the new common card Undertaker, which gained plus one plus one every time you played a Death Rattle minion. If you were going second, you could very easily do Undertaker followed by a 1 mana death rattle to make it a 2-3, which gave your opponent exactly one turn to answer it while only having 2 mana, before Undertaker's stats would grow wildly out of control and take the game almost single-handedly, mixing minion hits with the hunter hero power. While this deck was not immediately discovered, once its power was known, it rapidly took over effectively forcing the meta around it to be extremely control heavy, as decks like Zulok, Token Druid, and Miracle Rogue were not able to keep up with the out of control Undertaker without specific techs like Big Game Hunter. Balance updates would come around the time of the deck's discovery too on September 22nd, but the nurse were clearly not going to be targeting Death Rattle Hunter directly due to its delayed discovery. Leroy Jenkins would see its mana cost increase from 4 to 5, specifically targeting a combo trend in both Miracle Rogue and Handlock that could output in the realm of 20 plus damage if performed correctly, bringing down the ceiling of the combo significantly. This nerf wouldn't remove Leroy from decks outright though, as 5 mana for a 6 attack charging minion is still incredibly good, just not as good as before. Lastly, Starving Buzzard would be completely changed, seeing its attack increase from 2 to 3, its health from 1 to 2, and, most importantly, its cost being increased from 2 mana to 5. Starving Buzzard, since release, had caused significant issues with the balance of face and mid-range hunter decks in the meta, as it, plus Unleash the Hounds, was not only significant damage output, but a full hand refill under the right circumstances. This change made the Buzzard and Unleash combo cost a total of 8 mana, which made it nigh unplayable, eliminating one of the best parts of playing face hunter and leaving the deck far lower in power rankings, although hunter itself was getting a boom in popularity thanks to the recently discovered death Rattle Hunter. This would also be the meta landscape for one of the most important events in the game's history, taking place a little over a month after these changes. Hello everyone, welcome, come on in, grab a seat. We're at the Hearthstone World Championship opening weekend. The first annual Hearthstone World Championships took place at BlizzCon from November 2nd through the 8th of 2014, being the first major set of tournaments since the game's official launch. While there was an Innkeeper's Invitational in 2013, the game was still in closed beta at the time and the general player base could not qualify for it, so this marked the first tournament where anyone could qualify to play, with each region holding a qualifying tournament for the top 16 Legend players in their region, plus those who won high profile community tournaments or their last call tournament prior to the event, seeing a total of 16 players on the world stage, with 4 from Europe, Americas, and China each and two from Taiwan and Korea each. The format for the tournament would be referred to as Last Hero Standing, where each player would bring four different decks using four different classes, ban one out from their opponent, and play a best of five, where once you lost with the hero, you couldn't use it for the rest of the match. This is different from the formats used in the later years known as Conquest format, as there your hero is locked when you win, but this one tournament was played using the previous system, and there was no better showcase of its flaws than the Grand Finals themselves. US player Firebat would completely sweep his opponent China player Tiddler Celestial, 3 to nothing, using only his Druid deck, showing Firebat's complete mastery of the class and claiming the title of the first ever Hearthstone World Champion. Even though the format wasn't the best, this showcase on such a notable stage for the time, being the already heavily attended BlizzCon, showed how Blizzard was committed to Hearthstone and its competitive scene, which we would see grow over the course of the next year. 
After Worlds, the meta had finally fully settled from the balance changes, seeing Deathrattle Hunter, Zulok, Miracle Rogue, and Control Warrior all holding top spots in their own niches in the format, specifically with Miracle Rogue still being a top threat despite the nerfs to Leroy. Another balance patch would be put in place on December 4th, seeing nerfs to some of the top decks yet again. Flare, a hunter spell that saw occasional use, was nerfed from 1 mana to 2, as many players were opting to use it purely for the card draw it provided, cementing it as more of a counter to secret strategies instead of a draw tool. Soulfire, one of Zulok's big damage tools, was nerfed from 0 mana to 1, which would hurt Zoo's overall damage output, but nowhere near kill the deck. The change that was expected to be a huge game shift though was Gadget Zan Auctioneer, whose mana cost was increased from 5 to 6, delaying Miracle Rogue's big push by a turn, giving other decks more time to answer Auctioneer or Adventurer before the ball got rolling. These changes were also released in a patch that came with yet another shakeup to the meta landscape, and this one would cement a key attribute of Hearthstone's design for years to come. But you would never know Everything they seem to make is salty or explode Perfecting in perfection Goblins and gnomes Unleash goblin fury For Nomragon Releasing just four days after the previous balance patch, the first pack expansion in Hearthstone, Goblins vs. Gnomes, would change many aspects of the game moving forward. For starters, the set brought 123 new cards to the game, including 20 new legendaries, with mechs and their synergies being a highlight. Small mech packages, including cards like Clockwork Gnome, Annoyatron, and Piloted Shredder, along with their synergy cards like Cogmaster and Tinkertown Technician, would find their way into many decks of the format, with one major theme being common across most cards in this set, randomness. Up until this point, randomness had been an occasional factor in Hearthstone, but Goblins vs. Gnomes was the first set to truly embrace this aspect of the game, taking full advantage of the game's nature as a digital-only card game to create unique experiences in every game. These random factors were everywhere, such as the spare part mechanic, where some cards would give you a one-mana spell that provided some kind of benefit that you could apply to a minion, the piloted shredder minions that replaced themselves with a random minion of a certain kind on destruction, the bombers who threw random damage bursts around on summon, and many, many others. However, the main neutral that would encapsulate the themes of the set was undoubtedly Dr. Boom, a 7-mana seven 7-7 seven that summoned two 1-1 one -one Boom bots on Battlecry, which themselves dealt between 1 and 4 damage to a random enemy on Deathrattle. This was not only the perfect show of the randomness of the set, but also just a high enough power level to see significant play in many decks of the format, being by far and away the best legendary from the set. That statement does come with a catch though. It was the best legendary in the set, but very notably, the legendaries in this set were for the most part lackluster, with most being either extremely niche in their applications, or just bad. Even though this was the case, every class would receive a collection of 8 new cards, a significant boost compared to Nax's single class exclusive card per class, with each package having something of worth for their respective classes. Druid would gain a number of tools here to help their ramp and control strategies, like Anandai's Robocub, an early game drop that can be aggressive or defensive, Grove Tender, who provided a mana crystal to each player or a card draw to each player, and Tree of Life, which reset life totals for both players, all of which would find use over the set's lifetime. Hunter would find a bit of scattered theming with no real centralizing card. However, Glaive Zuka would be useful for its aggro and mid-range strategies, adding one attack to a random minion and itself being a 2-2 weapon. Mage was probably the biggest winner of the set, with six of its eight cards finding some kind of usage. Flame Cannon would see use as an early game clear tool, Snow Chugger, Soot Spewer, and Goblin Blast Mage would all see play in a newly created Mech Mage strategy, Unstable Portal would see play as a tool to extend Mage's reach, and Echo of Medivh would spawn a new deck on its own known as Fatigue Mage, where you'd attempt to clone Cold Light Oracle repeatedly to mill the opponent out while stalling with Mage's many freezing tools and secrets. Paladin would also see a significant boost here, gaining multiple new tools to solidify its arsenal like Shielded Minibot and Muster for Battle, both of which provided Paladin with early game pressure and a bit of board stickiness, something the class was significantly lacking up until now. 
They also received Bolvar Four Dragon, which while niche, was extremely useful in more mid-range style paladin builds due to the amount of smaller minions being thrown around in the early game. Priests for the time wouldn't see much of a change out of their new cards, although most notable here was undoubtedly Light Bomb, which under normal circumstances operated like a 6 mana board clear, being an excellent include for Control Priest. Rogue would see a semi-focus on weapon buffing here with Goblin Auto Barber and Tinker Sharp Sword Oil, both of which provided a significant boost to Rogue's hero power and would see some experimentation as the format developed. Shaman would mostly see aggro tools in this expansion, with Crackle being a standout, dealing 3-6 to six damage to a target, as well as other tools like Whirling Zapomatic, which could cause significant damage if left unanswered, and Neptalon, who refueled Shaman with a burst of Murlocs. Warlock would see a couple of new removal tools in Dark Bomb, which was a consistent 3 damage spell, and Implosion, which dealt 2-4 damage and summoned that many 1-1 imps, being by far the most played card from Warlock in this expansion. They also received Malganus, who is one of the best demons in Warlock's arsenal and would be mixed with Voidcaller to cheat it out early in decks like Zoo. Lastly, Warrior received Crush for its Control Warrior deck, being a 3-mana targeted removal tool if you control the damaged minion, but it also received Warbot and Screwjank Clunker for a potential Mech Warrior deck. As the meta developed, most of the top decks remained the same, simply adding in a couple of new pieces, like Handlock adding Dark Bomb, Antique Healbot, and Malganus, Zulok adding Implosion and Malganus, Ramp Druid occasionally adding Tree of Life, Control Warrior adding Crush, and Death Rattle Hunter adding Clockwork Gnome and Piloted Shredder. There are a couple of new decks in the meta too, like Midrange Token Paladin, which added Muster for Battle and Shielded Minibot to the deck to give its early game far more stability than it had previously, Mech Mage, which combined the aggro tendencies of the new mechs with Mage's already powerful freeze tools to quickly take over a game effectively, Midrange Weapon Rogue, which used the new weapon buff tools to hold a strong presence in the early to mid game, and both Mill Druid and Fatigue Mage, both of which had similar game plans of recycling Cold Light Oracle to mill out the opponent, with Druid backing it up with Tree of Life and Naturalize, and Mage using Echo of Medivh to copy the Oracle multiple times. While the meta was still developing from this set drop, a balance update would drop on January 29th, 2015, and it would finally answer a major issue with both the current meta and the previous meta environments. Undertaker was nerfed to no longer gain health when the Death Rattle minion was summoned, specifically answering the issue of Undertaker getting too big too fast to deal with while still allowing it to grow to massive attack values early. This change would effectively remove Death Rattle Hunter from the meta as the class once again pivoted back to its previous incarnations of Face and Midrange Hunter to varying levels of success. As those decks key combo of Buzzard and Unleash had already been nerfed prior to Goblins vs Gnomes release. The meta would continue to shift and change with the sudden absence of Death Rattle Hunter, as in this time, two major shifts in deck layouts would change their positions overall. The first of these, and probably more minor, was Demon Handlock, which had fully embraced Malganus as an integral piece of the deck and even moved to cut the Mountain Giants, the deck's core piece, for Voidcaller to get Malganus, Doomguard, and Dread Infernal onto the board faster. While this was a significant change to the deck's layout, it wasn't as major of a shift in presence as we saw with the rise of Oil Rogue. Oil Rogue was mostly an evolution of the previously explored mid-ranged Weapon Rogue, specifically taking advantage of the combination of Tinker's Sharp Sword Oil and the older card Blade Flurry, which destroyed the weapon to deal its damage to all opposing targets, including the opponent's face. Because of this, Assassin's Blade would be slotted into the deck as a way to stack multiple buffs to get multiple swings out of the buffed weapon, as the Hero Power version only had a durability of 2, making it hard to push advantage with. Other decks in the format were still present, like Midrange Paladin, Mech and Freeze Mage, Zoo and Handlock, Face and Midrange Hunter, Control Warrior, and even some smatterings of Control Priest and Midrange Shaman, but the top ranks mostly consisted of Oil Rogue and Mech Mage, being the strongest in the pool following the Undertaker nerfs. This environment would last until early April, when yet another expansion would release, and with it would come a scourge that many still remember to this day. Close in flame, calling any heroes out there that are brave <laughs> or just insane. Black Rock Mountain, a Hearthstone adventure. 
Black Rock Mountain was the third card pool edition and the second adventure expansion, beginning its release on April 2nd. Similarly to Nox before it, Black Rock would release one wing per week and trickle out its new cards slowly, allowing the meta time to adjust. At the time, Black Rock's card pool was considered significantly weaker than Nox before it, seeing a couple of standout cards, but nothing absolutely staple like Loatheb or Sludge Belcher before it. The set's main draw was the new Dragon Synergies, which at the time was a minion type that was relegated mostly to endgame bosses like Yazira and Deathwing. The dragons released here would mostly be mid-range styled, with many support cards focused on gaining effects while dragons were in hand, like Blackwing Technician and Corruptor, and various dragon threats for the mid-game, like Hungry Dragon, Draconid Crusher, Volcanic Drake, and the biggest dragon of the set, Nefarian. Nefarian stole two cards from the opponent's class on play, operating as a neutral version of some of Rogue's eventual class identity cards. These would see play in a couple of dragon-focused decks at the time, but wouldn't fully come together until more dragon support released later down the line. Far more impactful out of the neutrals was Emperor Tharazan, who reduced the cost of all cards in your hand by one at the end of the turn. While it was extremely unlikely for Tharasin to stick around for longer than a turn, he did prove to be an enabler of various combo strategies by reducing the overall cost of any combo by one per card it took, which enabled combos we've never seen before due to costing more than 10 total mana. Tharasin was by far and away the most played neutral out of the set, with the exception of one particular neutral card that we will save for last. On to class-specific additions, all classes received two cards each, not really expanding their playstyles far, but some pieces would see play. Druid received Druid of the Flame, which provided either an offensive or defensive body on turn 3, which proved useful for Token Druid due to the stickiness of a 5 health body. Hunter received Quickshot and Core Rager, two cards that encouraged Hunter to drop to no cards in hand, which was usually easy to achieve thanks to its naturally aggro playstyle. Mage received Flamewalker, which was easily one of the best class-specific cards, able to deal 2 damage at random any time you casted a spell, which made it a perfect fit for Freeze Mage at the time. Paladin received Solemn Vigil, an excellent addition to mid-range strategies due to the tokens constantly dying, and Dragon Consort, who wasn't particularly strong now, but would be an enabler alongside later sets. Priest received Twilight Whelp, another dragon enabler that would be more impactful later, and Resurrect, which gave a new class identity to priests centered around reviving massive minions, which similarly would be picked up on alongside later sets. Rogue received Dark Iron Skulker, who operated as a pseudo board clear for more mid-range rogue strategies, and Gang Up, which alone enabled Mill Rogue as a deck, able to duplicate Cold Light Oracle similarly to how Mage did previously to deck the opponent out rapidly. Shaman would receive new tools here for its Overload package in Fireguard Destroyer and Lava Shock, but neither of these would be enough to push the package into meta viability. Warlock once again received new tools in its Zulok deck, being Imp Gang Boss and Demon Wrath, both of which provided excellent board coverage for 3 mana. Lastly for the class specifics, Warrior would receive Axe Flinger and Revenge, two more cards to mix into its Enrage mechanic engine, with Revenge in particular operating as a board clear spell in the later stages of the game. However, there is one more card I have to mention, and unfortunately, it's a little too important to just simply gloss over. Grim Patron was a 5 mana 3-3 three, three that, when it survived damage, summoned another full health Grim Patron. Initial looks at this card slotted it into Enrage Warrior packages, but saying it was just a tool for that deck was the understatement of the century. Grim Patron would form its own new deck known as Patron Warrior, combining it with Warsong Commander, who gave any minion summoned with 3 or less attack charge, which, yeah, you can probably see where this is going. Grim Patron could continuously summon out new Grim Patrons, all of which had charge under Warsong, and all of which could summon more Patrons when damaged, causing one of the most infamous problem decks in the game's history. Because of this interaction, other combo decks effectively phased out of the meta for the time, leaving the meta effectively with nothing but Patron Warrior, Control Warrior, and a few mid-range options, like Mid-Range Hunter, who abused the early damage of Lepernome and Abusive Sergeant and the mid-game control tools like Lotheb and Sludge Belter to counter out decks that countered Patron Warrior, Hybrid Hunter, which mixed this with a heavier aggro toolbox, 
and Midrange Demon Zoo, which utilized the new Imp Gang boss with previous Void Caller cheat outs to take games before Patron Combo could be done. We would see Patron Warrior completely dominate the space for the entirety of Blackrock's time as the newest set, with the only patch bringing anything of note being on June 15th, which introduced Tavern Brawl game modes. Effectively, a rotation of unique game modes and challenges to play against other players, commonly repurposing content from the single player expansions at first, but quickly growing into its own unique spin on the current state of the game. We also received our first three alternate hero portraits here, being Magni for Warrior, Alaria for Hunter, and Medivh for Mage, all three of which could be purchased from the store. This would be the first, and for a time only, hero portraits available. As for the time, the concept was shelved until much later into the game's life. For now though, Patron Warrior continued to rage on in the background as we approached August and a new set to hopefully change the status quo. From east to west, heroes are set. Seeking glory in the greatest of events. The legends will rise based on their merits. There's even pirates riding paras. It's the grand tournament. The grand tournament was the fourth card pool edition and the second expansion pack launched on August 24th, 2015. Similarly to Goblins vs. Gnomes, Grand Tournament was a large pack-based expansion, bringing 132 new cards, 20 of which were legendaries. At the time, this was one of the most hyped expansions in the game's history, bringing not only new cards, but the game's first new keyword, Inspire. While new keywords are a staple of expansions now, at the time this was completely groundbreaking and new, as keywords were something that the developers had steered clear of for the longest time due to the effects of keywords on newer players, requiring that they learn what every keyword does while picking up the game, which can be overwhelming if there's no form of limit on what mechanic is turned into a keyword rather than simply writing it on the card. Inspire was the first time a keyword was added, triggering an effect of a card anytime you used your hero power, kind of operating like a cost to using the ability of two mana. Because of this new mechanic, various cards through this expansion were based on modulating or improving a player's hero power, which culminated into Justashar Trueheart, who on Battlecry upgraded your hero power to a more powerful version unique to each class, such as Hunter being able to tap for 3 damage, Paladin summoning 2 Silverhand recruits, or Warrior gaining 4 armor. Because these upgrades were so significant, Justashar Trueheart would find a place in various mid-range and control decks due to the long-term value she provided but not a staple presence like Dr. Boom before her. The other primary mechanic of this set was Joust, where you and your opponent would reveal a random card in your deck and whoever revealed the higher cost card was the winner. There was an issue out the gate with this mechanic in that most of the Joust effects are primarily for aggro and mid-range strategies as a way to boost your power in those stages of the game. But the way it operated effectively punished you for building your decks in this way making the mechanic almost completely dead on arrival outside of a couple of control options that operated better under it. As for other neutral additions, Flame Juggler was a 2-mana tempo minion that could potentially remove a threat on board, Argent Horse Rider was a charger with Divine Shield, becoming an excellent tool for aggro strategies, Refreshment Vendor was an excellent stabilizing tool for control and combo decks, as the healing was higher than normal for the stat line, and you standardly wouldn't be damaging the opponent early in those decks, Twilight Guardian was a 4-mana 3-6 with Taunt for Dragon decks, being another boost to the strategy. Frost Giant served as a payoff for hero power focused decks, effectively being free at later stages of the game. Ida's Darkbane became a linchpin in minion buffing strategies, performing board clears as she's buffed up. Nexus Champion Sarad was occasionally played as a late game spell generator for control strategies. Bolf Ramshield was a potential add-in for Handlock, acting as a secondary health source for your hero power. Chillmaw was another large taunt body for dragon decks, doubling as a board clear on destruction. Sky Captain Crag was a payoff for pirate decks, acting as a charger that could be heavily discounted. And Ice Howl was notable for being a testing point for a future mechanic, being a charging minion that couldn't attack heroes, something that would be revisited a few years later. Moving into class specifics, Druids would receive a couple of powerful tools to work with that had unique applications, like Druid of the Saber giving effectively a 2 damage hit right there, or a 3 damage hit the next turn, Dornassus Aspirant, who provided a temporary mana crystal and required an immediate answer, 
Living Roots, which served as both board clear and minion flooding for Token Druid, Savage Combatant, whose Inspire effect made your hero power pack a punch, and Aviana, a combo enabler that made all cards cost one, which would see experimentation at the time with Emperor Tharsen, but not mainstay play until a later release. Hunter's offerings were relatively weak compared to the previous releases, gaining Bear Trap, a secret that could protect your face from aggro pushes, King Zelic, a Joust minion that potentially offered a minion draw for more mid-range strategies, and Ram Wrangler, who served as a potential payoff for playing more beasts in your deck. Mage would gain a few great tempo tools here in Spellslinger, whose random add often benefited Mage more than the opponent, Flame Lance as a single target burst shot, Arcane Blast as a one mana spell that gained double spell damage, Fallen Hero and Koldara Drake as a potential build around for Ping Mage, a deck focused on using the hero power every turn, and Ronin, an 8 mana 7 7 that replaced himself with three arcane missiles on Death Rattle. Undoubtedly, the winner of this expansion was Paladin, who received various powerful tools for its arsenal, such as Warhorse Trainer to buff out your Silver Hand recruits and mid range Paladin, Murloc Knight as a potential board flutter with its Inspire effect. Tuskar Jouster as a control option Joust minion that was arguably the best Joust in the set thanks to it being built for a control deck, Edric the Pure, which kneecapped an entire board of its attack, and the two most important pieces here, Competitive Spirit and Mysterious Challenger. Mysterious Challenger would be the piece that spawned a new deck in Secret Paladin, as for the 6 mana you get a 6-6 six, six body and 5 different Paladin secrets out of your deck and onto the board, of which Competitive Spirit was one of buffing your board further as a follow-up into the next turn. Secret Paladin would move from here to be one of the best decks in the Grand Tournament format once a certain other nuisance was dealt with. Pre-selection for this time was not the greatest yet again, but did hold some potential moving forward, like Flash Heal, which is a 1-mana heal 5, and Wormrest Agent, a 2-mana two 2-4 two taunt if you're holding a dragon, once again adding to Priest's dragon synergies. Their legendary minion was also worth noting, being Confessor Paltris whose Inspire ability turns your 2-mana heal 2 into a summon of a legendary minion, being an interesting inclusion for certain builds of Control Priest. Rogue would see a series of pirate synergies here, most notably in Buccaneer, whose weapon boost was a great addition to the already popular Oil Rogue, and Shady Dealer, who threatened to be a powerful drop in a pirate-focused deck. Burgle was also one of the first major instances of what would eventually become a key class identity of Rogue, being stealing cards from the opponent's class, or Thief Rogue which wasn't popular now, but would grow from here to be more and more common in rogue strategies. Also included here were Beneath the Grounds, which effectively booby-trapped the opponent's deck with 4-4s, and Anubarak, who was a repeatable 9-mana 8-4 that summoned a 4-4 on Death Rattle and returned itself to hand when it did, making it a real annoyance to out. Shaman would receive a variety of cards here for buffing its totem and overload synergies, like Ancestral Knowledge, which acted like Arcane Intellect that split the mana cost between turns, Totem Golem, one of Shaman's most powerful tempo tools at the time being a 2-mana 3-4, Tuskar Totemic, who summons a basic totem with itself, Drenay Totem Carver, who boosts all totems by 1-1 one, one on Battlecry, Thunderbluff Valiant, who buffs all totems by 2 attack on Inspire, making your hero power summons effectively 2-2s two or 3-1s, Elemental Destruction, a board wipe spell for 3 mana at the effective cost of your next turn, and Mistcaller, who boosted the stats of all minions in hand and deck by 1-1, but was a little too expensive to be useful by the time it comes down. Warlock would see a couple of cards primarily focused around their discard mechanic with varying levels of success, with their most noteworthy card not in that package being Fearsome Doomguard, a 7-mana 6-8 that is a well-statted demon for cheating out with Voidcaller. Lastly, Warrior received a couple of new tools primarily for a control strategy, like Bash, which was both a clear spell and armor gain, Alexstrasza's Champion, a 2-mana 3-3 with charge if you held a dragon, and Varian Wern, who drew 3 on Battlecry, placing any minions drawn onto the field immediately, which required specific deck-building choices to be powerful. After this initial release period, the meta sat effectively unchanged, with Patron Warrior still the top threat in the meta and the remainder of the field being decks we've seen before with the sole exception of Secret Paladin, which saw two variants, one focused on aggro pushes and Divine Favor to refill the hand, and one focused on a more mid-range curve-out ending in a Tyrion. This would shift about two months after the Grand Tournament's release on October 20th, 2015, when Warsong Commander would receive an update to her effect, completely changing it from its previous iteration to, your charge minions have plus one attack. This was a complete 
gutting of what the card was meant to be, and with it, a complete gutting of the current iteration of Patron Warrior, leaving all of the summoned patrons without the ability to charge. With this change, the meta swung wildly in a different direction than before, seeing two classes effectively take over the meta. The first of these was Paladin, as its secret variant was now more powerful with Patron no longer in the format, as well as with the addition of Aldor Peacekeeper to the deck nullifying early game pushes, solidifying the curve out variant of the deck taking center stage moving forward, although most builds did still opt to play one divine favor for edge cases where it was desired. In addition to this, Midrange Paladin found its footing here too, with Equality and Consecration being used together as a board clear combo, and Justice Shard True Heart making your hero power summon two Silver Hand recruits at a time, allowing your Silver Hand buffs like Quartermaster and Warhorse Trainer to be all the more effective. The other class that would emerge from this upheaval was Druid, who similar to Paladin would see two major decks emerge as dominant threats, being Midrange Druid, as without Patron Warrior in the format, the deck could more easily establish boards and control the field with its early game tools like Living Roots, and still threaten the bread and butter combo of Force of Nature plus Savage Roar, and the other variant being Aggro Druid, which similarly used its early game tools to flood the board with smaller tokens, make them difficult to remove with cards like Soul of the Forest, and follow up with Savage Roar and Power of the Wild to wide buff the board and end the game rapidly, which took heavy advantage of all of the slower, more control-oriented decks in the format. Other decks present in the format included Midrange Hunter, Freeze Mage, Midrange Demon Zoo, Midrange Tempo Mage, Face Hunter, and Control Warrior, but all of these were significantly less well positioned than the Paladin and Druid decks. Good to see you again. Pull up a chair by the hearth. This meta environment would be the backdrop for the second ever World Championships for Hearthstone, taking place at BlizzCon from October 28th through November 7th of 2015 seeing a similar structure to the previous year's events with a couple of notable changes. The first of these was the removal of the Korea and Taiwan qualifying tournaments, being replaced by a single Asia-Pacific championship that qualified four players similar to the other three qualifiers. The second, and most impactful change for sure, was the retirement of the last hero standing format, being replaced by the Conquest format still in use today, where players would bring four heroes, ban one from their opponent, and play a best of five where once you won with a hero, you couldn't use them for the rest of the match. This change in format allowed for the showcase of far more diverse matches than the previous year, as you wouldn't have a single class completely sweep a match like how finals went in the previous year. However, the finals this year would see Sweden's Ostaka beat Canada's Hot Form in three back-to-back -back matches yet again, with Ostaka's Freeze Mage, Enrage Warrior, and Oil Rogue defeating Hot Form's Tempo Mage, Oil Rogue, and Midrange Druid respectively. The sweep wouldn't have time to shake up the meta as you might expect, as less than a week after the World Championship's conclusion, the next set release would once again change various factors about the meta, and by extension, the structure of Hearthstone itself forever. We've traversed the tombs of Naxxramas. We've climbed every cliff on Black Rock. Now the world cries out for heroes as a new evil rises. Who will answer the call? We will be explorers lead, and we are in need of explorers. Adventure we seek, cross land we see, born to come and join us. Ooh, yes! The League of Explorers is the fifth card pool edition and the third adventure expansion in Hearthstone, beginning on November 12th, 2015. Similarly to previous expansions, Explorers would bring a smaller batch of cards alongside its single player content for players to enjoy, being a smaller collection of additions to the game. Unlike the previous expansions, however, the legendary minions here were almost all incredibly good and filled their own niches in the metagame, warping new and old decks around their presence. Starting with the one outlier, Elise Starseeker, on summon, would shuffle a map to the Golden Monkey into the deck, which itself would shuffle a Golden Monkey into the deck, which replaced your entire hand in deck with random legendary minions. This payoff was far too random to be worth the extremely long side quest of digging through your deck to get to, marking Elise as the only legendary from the set that would see absolutely no play. Just above Elise in playability was the arc villain Rafam, who showcased the brand new keyword of Discover, where the player would get to choose an option from either a static set of three or from three randomly generated options that filled the condition. This particular mechanic, representing a pseudo-controlled randomness, would be so universally well-received that it would be adopted into the game almost as a core mechanic rather than a one-set keyword, becoming integral to the core identity of Hearthstone itself. 
Rafam's Discover was from a static pool, allowing the player to choose a 10 mana spell to add to their hand, being the Lantern of Power, able to buff a minion by 10-10, the Mirror of Doom, which filled your board with 3-3 mummy zombies, and the Timepiece of Horror, dealing 10 damage split amongst all enemies. While these aren't the greatest options, Rafam would see the occasional play in Control Warrior specifically as a late game body and 10 mana option to help close out games. On to the big three of the expansion. Sir Finley Mergleton was a 1 mana 1 3 that discovered a new hero power on Battlecry, giving the option for decks that didn't really have a good aggressive hero power to play more aggro variants by discovering an aggressive hero power, like Paladin's Silverhand Summon, Warlock's Draw, Mage's Ping, and the most powerful of all, Hunter's Face Shot. Finley would be played regularly in the meta following this release, which we'll get to shortly. Bran Bronzebeard was a 3-mana minion that let you double up any battle cries while he was on the board, which was yet another powerful combo enabler, especially when set up with Emperor Tharasen from Blackrock. While no major combo threat would be popularized here with Bronn, his power was well noted as an enabler for potential decks as we move forward into the next year. Lastly, and most immediately impactful, Reno Jackson was a 6-mana minion that, on battle cry, fully restored your hero to full health if your deck held no duplicates. This one minion ushered in an era of Highlander decks, or decks with no more than one copy of each card, as the full heal option with Reno was by far and away one of the best payoffs you could have for deck building choices. Most commonly seen at this point in time with Warlock, spawning the deck known as Reno Lock, a spin on the previous Handlock deck that aimed to refuel health multiple times during the match thanks to Reno Jackson's and Jaraxxus's battle cries. As for other neutral cards, a few Discover tools would also see play here like Jeweled Scarab, Gorilla Bot A3, and Tomb Spider, with Jeweled Scarab seeing the most success among these. Moving into class specifics, each class received three total cards this time, up from the two in Blackrock and the one in Noxramas, giving each class more opportunities to change and adapt. For Druid, Raven Idol was a one-mana spell that gave the option to discover a minion or a spell, depending on what was needed at the time and Mounted Raptor was an instant slot in for aggro and mid-range Druid, replacing itself with a one-cost minion on Death Rattle, making its removal more difficult. Hunter's tools were far more limited this time around, with the only real notable inclusion being Desert Camel, which summons a one-cost from both decks on Battlecry, potentially a useful card against control, but can backfire very easily since the opponent's minion can attack the following turn. Mage would get great tools in Forgotten Torch, a 3-mana three 3 damage spell that shuffles a 3-mana 6 damage spell into the deck, Ethereal Conjurer, who discovered a spell on Battlecry, and Animated Armor, which provided a stall option, reducing all incoming damage instances to 1. Paladin would also receive powerful new tools here with Sacred Trial, a secret that destroys a minion when the opponent tries to summon a 4th, seeing an instant slot into Secret Paladin, Keeper of Uldemen, setting anything to 3-3 on a Battlecry, seeing play in basically every Paladin deck as both an offensive and defensive tool, and anything can happen, which resummoned up to 7 Murlocs that died that game, seeing some experimentation. Priest tools were a bit more specialized, seeing a board clear spell in Excavated Evil for Control Priest, Museum Curator, who discovered a Death Rattle minion on Battlecry, useful in almost all Priest decks, and Entomb, a 6-mana targeted removal spell that placed the minion into your deck, which would see occasional play. Rogue got new tools in Tomb Pillager, who gave a coin on Death Rattle, enabling some combos for Rogue, and Unearthed Raptor, who copied a Death Rattle on Battlecry, seeing its own deck spin off from this known as Raptor Rogue. Shaman was one of the big winners of this particular expansion, specifically thanks to Tunnel Trog, a one mana drop that gains attack when you overload your mana. Tunnel Trog would be mixed with Totem Golem from the Grand Tournament to form a deceptively powerful turn 2 board, forming the backbone of what would become known as Aggro Shaman, which also took heavy advantage of Sir Finley replacing the Shaman hero power with a more aggressive one, seeing a good amount of play out the gate here, but would grow far more desirable as we entered the next year. They also received Everything is Awesome, which would spark some experimentation once again surrounding Murloc Shaman, with many doubling back to Neptulian from Goblins vs Gnomes but this would not be a viable strategy for the time being. Warlock would only really receive Dark Peddler here in terms of playable cards, who did fill a niche, able to discover a one-cost card so you could tap your hero power and play a card on the following turn. If there was a loser of the set, unfortunately, it would have to be Warrior, as the only useful card they received here was Fierce Monkey, being a 3-mana three 3-4 three with Taunt, which while useful, was substantially under what everyone else got. 
As for how the meta shook out from here, Paladin and Druid were both still kings of the format, only now with a couple of other players vying for those top positions like Aggro Shaman, Freeze Mage, Reno and Zulok, Control Warrior, a new rendition of Patron Warrior that was closer to the previous Enrage Warrior, and a new face in Malagos Warlock, which had been present in previous formats but was substantially stronger now thanks to the combination of Bran Bronzebeard and Antique Healbot able to provide stabilization. While not much had changed from the League of Explorers release metagame-wise, change was absolutely on the horizon. An update was pushed on March 14th that added an additional 9 deck slots to the game, upping the total amount of decks you could save to 18 and adding a new Paladin hero portrait for Liadrin, which was obtainable through an upcoming promotion with World of Warcraft. While the deck slot upgrade had been a requested quality of life update for some time, there was a different reason behind it, which was to prepare us for the biggest shift in Hearthstone's history up until this point. Prior to the deck slot upgrade, Blizzard had announced that with the arrival of the first expansion of 2016, the newly coined Year of the Kraken would begin, and with it, the first rotation in Hearthstone's history would occur. Up until this point, all cards released in the history of the game were legal to use, but moving forward, only cards from the previous and current year would be legal, with a rotation occurring on the drop of the first expansion of each year. This meant that with the next set's release, Curse of Noxramas and Goblins vs Gnomes would no longer be allowed in the standard format, which would clearly shake up the metagame on its own, but would also leave some decks arguably in a far overpowered position compared to decks with pieces from those expansions. With this in mind, on April 24th, 2016, two days prior to the next expansion's drop, the largest set of balance changes since the beta were released, attempting to bring some balance to what was bound to be a chaotic few weeks. Moving through the neutrals, Ironbeak Owl would have its mana cost increase from 2 to 3, Big Game Hunter from 3 to 5, Molten Giant from 20 to 25, Knife Juggler's attack would be decreased from 3 to 2, Leopard Gnomes from 2 to 1, and Arcane Golem would have its health increase from 2 to 4, but had its charge removed. On to Druid, who had significantly dominated the last few metas. Ancient of Lore would only be able to draw 1 now, down from 2, Keeper of the Grove had its health reduced from 4 to 2, and most impactfully, Force of Nature had its cost reduced from 6 to 5, but the Treants it summoned no longer had charge or died at the end of the turn. This last change would absolutely decimate the previous iterations of Midrange Druid in the format, with various changes being needed for the deck as the previous 14 damage combo was gone with this. Hunter would see Hunter's Mark's cost increase from 0 to 1, which was a relatively minor change. And lastly, Rogue would see Blade Flurry's cost decrease from 4 to 2, but now it only hit minions, and Master of Disguise's stealth now only lasted for a turn, nerfing both Oil and Miracle Rogue with these changes. With this in mind, a new era of Hearthstone was on the horizon, and as we entered 2016 and what would be considered by many to be a golden era of the game, more and more new and unique decks would come into the space, changing how the game is played forever. A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Jukes, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, and Ryza339, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you want to help support the channel and see my videos a day early, consider supporting me on Patreon, where support tiers start at just $1 a month. If you enjoyed what you saw here today, consider subscribing to the channel. We're actually getting really close to 20,000 subscribers, so any little bit helps. So be sure to pound that subscribe button. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.